Father, we give you thanks this morning for your faithfulness, for the new morning mercies that we received as we even woke up and there was air to breathe. We thank you for uh, the legs that we have, that we were able to even move, and uh, we recognize that we have all of our being in you, and we are thankful for your sovereignty and your providence in our lives that would uh, lead us here. Father, what better place to be uh, than uh, this morning to gather in uh, the house of the Lord to worship and to be edified. So, Father, I pray that our time this morning would uh, exalt Christ, that we would grow in knowledge, knowledge applied, though, that it might... uh, be fitting for us, equip us to engage the world around us, but also to understand and to look back on the history, your history of your faithfulness uh, throughout the generations. Help us, Lord, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to receive your truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're all familiar with the book of Esther, I'm sure, and uh, in Esther chapter 4, there is a very famous or, um, there, you know, we, we, we begin to reach to a climatic portion. In Esther chapter 4, uh, there's a conversation between Esther and Mordecai. And in chapter 4, verse 12, we read, And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise up for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And so what we have here um, by way of Esther and Mordecai's statement here is a couple of things that I want us to see and how this relates to church history and our understanding of what we will cover today. Mordecai is absolutely convinced of the sovereignty of God, that deliverance will come, and but if Esther is silent, it'll still come. She just will not be uh, the vessel used. But then he also looks at providence, the providence of God, and says, perhaps you were brought here to rescue us for such a time as this. Esther, as we know, is clearly the one that God had brought for such a time as that to rescue the Jews. But what I find interesting is when I think about her, is that she's not an anomaly. Throughout history, throughout the centuries, we can think of many names that God has raised up in their generation, and we could say for such a time as this. There are the extraordinary ones. There's Moses, there's Elijah, there's Esther, there's John the Baptist, there's Jesus Christ at, 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 the, at the fullness of time. God sent forth his son. But God hasn't stopped raising up men and women, champions of the faith, It's, you know, as the canon has been completed and we get past the first century, we don't have the biblical revelation, but now we get to look at the history of the church. And I want us to consider, as we have done for the past couple weeks, we've been looking at specific figures and events that are building up to the, to the Protestant Reformation as we're, as we're seeing the ground swell, that this didn't happen in a vacuum. And so there are two names that are worthy of consideration that God raised up for such a time as this. That will be Jan Hus and Martin Luther. And they are well worth our consideration um, this morning. So, we will first begin with Jan Hus. Uh, Some people will look at his name, and it can be looked at as John Hus. But I would argue that his name is Hus. It rhymes with Goose. And that was his nickname, The Goose. And so let's talk a little bit about this figure. You can see his dates, uh, his, the, the time in which he lived. Remember, John Wycliffe, or Wycliffe, is, is, he dies in 1384. So there's a little bit of overlap. They didn't necessarily meet each other because Hoos is uh, from uh, a little further away. My clicker is kind of... All right. 
we're working on it. Maybe I just got to raise it up a little higher. So a few things that we want to know just by facts about this, this character here. He's got a beard just like everybody does in this time. Um, he, he doesn't have the stick like, like Wycliffe does, uh, but he's, he's Bohemian. He's born in the modern-day Czech Republic, southern Bohemia. He's born into poverty. So he pays his way through school by singing and manual labor. I, I, don't, if, I could never have done that. I would never have made a dime if I was the, to sing. But for manual labor, this, what you see about him is he's a hard worker. He's willing to do what it takes in order to get the job done or to get to where he needs to be. 1402, uh, he's ordained uh, to the Bethlehem Church. Uh, he is appointed the rector or uh, the, uh, the, the pastor of the University of Prague. And again, Hoos. He is the goose. This is, this is the nickname given to him. And so why consider this man? What is significant about him? Well, uh, maybe on the next slide as we'll get there. He is greatly influenced by Wycliffe or Wycliffe. This is very important because we need to see the series of dominoes. He's a pre-reformer, right? Wycliffe and, and Hus are the pre-reformers. You, it's, it's, it's not an overstatement to say that Wycliffe is the grandfather of the Reformation where, or the great-grandfather where Hus is the grandfather of the Reformation and Luther is just the one who lit the spark and set it ablaze. Um, so again, uh, some information about uh, uh, Hus that is helpful for us. Um, 1402, he was ordained. Um, he was a Wycliffian in almost every aspect of the word. He was cut from the same cloth. And so when Wycliffe's or Wycliffe's writings were, were banned by the Catholic Church, they were to be burned, he, he would get uh, Wycliffe's writings snuck in to, to Bohemia, and he would be reading them. It was like the, the documents that you weren't allowed to have, but he was greatly influenced by the writings and the teachings of Wycliffe. In 1405, the propagation of Wycliffe's writings uh, were, were, were banned by Pope Innocent VII. Um, but that would not deter uh, uh, Hus by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, he, he shared the same conviction, that, that, that which was the groundswell that was going on, was that the question of authority. We left off last week. Where does authority lie? Was it in the Pope? Was it in the councils or this relatively new, I wouldn't even say new, this age-old understanding that had been buried under layers and layers of, uh, of the hierarchy was sola scriptura, that authority lie in the word of God, that, that, that the, the word is not under but over all things of the church. And so this starts to, because of the great schism and the things that were going on, this starts to gain traction. And so he believed that the authority lie in the word of God. And he was also one who came out and preached and taught there was a need for a radical reformation of the church. He was one of the first to start to use this language of reformation. Now, again, I think we need to understand, when we talk about the reformers, they never had this idea that they were going to start a Protestant church. The idea was that it was unheard of to, to, to start a whole new church. That wasn't going to happen. It was that it needed to be reformed. There are practices that are going on that need to be addressed. There are problems that we see that we need to look at. Semper reformanda, always reforming. That was the battle cry of the Reformation, but that's what they were calling for. There are things that are slipping. Let's address these issues. And so Wycliffe or, or, or Hus starts to call for this reformation. Well, it doesn't take long before he catches... Uh, the, you know, his, his following in Bohemia starts to grow, and uh, he's got the platform in the university, and the higher-ups in Rome start to hear about him. And at first, he's just this little pest, but he starts to become a bigger nuisance. And so, what must we do with these Hussites that are causing this stir? So, 
He, they, he gets excommunicated in 14.10 or 14.11 because of his outspoken, I'll give you some of his quotes here, but because of his outspoken defiance against the Pope and papal authority, he was very loud. Where, where Wycliffe was like the first, who stands on his shoulders and his voice gets louder to the point where Luther stands on Hus's shoulders and his voice is heard throughout. So, but this is a pre-reformer. He's beginning uh, to lay the groundwork here. So in 1410 or 1411, he is excommunicated. He was later, uh, these are one of his quotes, where he would, he would argue and say that a pope who did not submit to the authority of Scripture held no legitimate authority over believers. Now, this was a big deal. This attacks at the core. And so, what was there, what were you to do with such a person that would be, according to the church of this day, spewing all of this heresy? That is, that is, that is flipping and twisting the minds of the common, the illiterate that are telling those people that, no, the priesthood of the believer is you. A man who is saying that you should be able to read the Bible in your own language. What do we do? He was a well-liked person from the Bohemians, but as his position kept becoming stronger and stronger, his, the university ends up turning on him. The church ends up turning on him. And he's standing with loved by the people, but turned on by the religious folks of the day. So in 1412, he was asked to leave the city of Prague, and he was sent into exile. But in his time of exile, he gave himself to the preaching in writing. Remember we talked a little bit last week? Movements gain and continue their traction because there are people who write. Writing outlives people. And so he devoted himself to writing. And it was similar to how Wycliffe was removed later in his life. And so what ends up happening in 14, uh, 1414, the Council of Constance is called, and we could pull this up here too. And he was humiliated at this council. So last week we considered the Council of Constance, I think briefly, but this was to put an end to the Great Schism. Remember that there was rival popes that were, you know, fighting each other and excommunicating each other. There was one in France in Avignon, and then there was one in Rome. And the question was, well, who is the rightful pope? Who is the, the vicar of Christ? And then in 1409 at the Council of Pisa, they said, we're going to put an end to this. And so we're both, we're going to get rid of both of you popes, and we're going to elect Alexander, and he is going to be the rightful pope. Well, neither one of those popes recognized the council, so now there were three popes in 1409. And the question then became, which one? And this was causing people to be disillusioned and, and question authority. They couldn't get it right. They didn't understand. And so they call the Council of Constance because they want to put an end to the great schism. They want to uh, have the one rightful pope. Uh, and at the same time, there was this crazy man in Bohemia that was causing a stir. He was turning people away from supreme authority found in the papacy. He was turning people towards the word of God. He was preaching, according to them at the time, heretical doctrine. And so they call, they, 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 there's this council that's called. They clear up, as we talk, talked about last week, they clear up the uh, great schism. And there's one elected pope while the others resign. And then they have to deal with Hus. Hus is asked to attend. He's promised safety, that he would be able to come to the council to explain his positions. And so, by a friend says, we will, we will take you and we will promise you safe travel. So, Hus obliges. He's ready to appear before the council. And he's asked, as he appears before the council, they ask him to recant his writings. This was in 1414. 
Now, we know something like this happens roughly 100 years later, right? And so Hus is standing before the Council of Constance, and they're saying, you need to take back everything that you've said, all that you've preached against the Pope, against authority, and submit yourself to the Mother Church. According to one author, this is what Hus said in response. Well, he said that he refused to admit that the charges against him were true unless proven so by Scripture. So his stance was, if I'm wrong, show me. If I'm wrong, take me to the word of God that you might prove to me the error of my ways. So he, so he was willing to at least hear so far as they used the same authority. At the council, Hus was found guilty. He was condemned to die as a heretic. And so on July 6, 1415, they burn him at the stake. It is, according to reports concerning his death, when he died burning at the stake, he was singing. At the same time, the council decided we need to go back to the grave of Wycliffe and we need to dig him up. We need to burn his bones too. And you know what? We're going to throw the ashes of Wycliffe and we're going to throw the ashes of Hoos into the same river swift. Gone as their thoughts were. Gone and never to be remembered. Desecrated, condemned. But the reality was, it was just as, as, the, as the, the river swift sent them out, their writings, their impact carried on long after their death. They were raised up for such a time as this. The importance of Wycliffe and Hoos cannot be understated. They're, especially when we consider Hoos, you could trace the importance of his writings both backwards and forwards. He was greatly influenced by Wycliffe, as we have said, but he also greatly influenced the German who would precede him or proceed him, Martin Luther. In one of his famous writings, it was called the De Ecclesia, or the Church. And then in his volume, he addressed many issues concerning the church. He held to a strong Augustinian theology. But he, here's one of his quotes. He believed that all the church is made up of all those who are predestined to salvation. Here's his quote. The holy Catholic church is the body or congregation of all the predestinate, the dead, the living, and those yet to be. So he's arguing for the universal church in this past, present, future. He also wrote and he believed that the church could exist without a pope. This was worthy to gasp about in those days. Huss affirmed that Christ called himself the rock, not Peter, and the church is founded on him by virtue of predestination. And like Wycliffe, Hus, Hus's writings stripped the power from the Pope and sought to reform the thinking of the church in matters of tradition and doctrine. He argued that the Bishop of Rome was of no more prestige than any other bishop and believed, quote, to rebel against an erring pope is to obey Christ. You understand that though he had his following, he's a lone voice in this time. He was willing to die for these things because, well, that was the course that would have occurred. One other quote of him um, in his, in, his, in his book, where the popes, the popes forbade preaching outside of churches, Hus's reply was this, no papal excommunication may be an impediment to doing what Christ did and taught to be done. So he was saying, where there are people, there can be preaching. He, he, he was against other things as well, uh, but he caused enough of a stir to be martyred. You'll find him in Fox's Book of Martyrs. But again, as we would look in Hebrews 11, though Abel died, he still speaks. Hus would influence Martin Luther in a great way as he would look and Martin Luther would pick up on Hus's work and he would carry that along. Though Hus was dead, he still 
spoke. And so, this is what's going on. Yes, sir. Well, he was ordained as a, as a minister in the church, though, too. So his excommunicate, but he could have been excommunicated just as a as a church member, just to be removed from from the body. But again, we have to understand at this time, excommunication is not just like, oh, you're out of this church, go to the church down the road. To be excommunicated from the church when the church and the state are all one thing means that you are you are you are exiled, you are sent out. You know, it is to be like outside the camp in Israel. Uh, it was not a thing where you would still be able, but also because he had his circle, right, his sphere of people that really, really liked him, they were going to take the excommunication, but they weren't going to let him suffer too bad. You know, they, they were, you know, they were still going to care for him. Um, but you will notice with Wycliffe, with Hus, and with Luther, all the reforming efforts began in the university, all of those men taught in the universities. Oftentimes when you see throughout history swells of revival and reformation, it's the students that hear of these things, that, that are moldable and hear these truths. Um, but that, that is a good part. Yes, he could have been excommunicated, but because of his position in the university, that gave him a higher platform. That's what caught the recognition. Um, as well. Uh, but yeah, that's a good comment, Dave. So let's close the chapter on the 15th century. And just as you understand, again, all of this is build up. This is build up to, to getting to, um, again, this, this event, this phenomenon that took place in the 16th century uh, that revolutionized Western civilization. The Protestant Reformation goes well beyond just the walls of churches. I mean, I don't want to get ahead of myself on this, but the, but the reverberation, you know, it's kind of like when you throw a rock into the water and you start seeing the ripples. The Protestant Reformation touched almost every aspect of life. You know, there was, uh, it was said um, after the Reformation in the, in, the, in the 16th and 17th century, if two people were going up to get a job and they found out that one of them was a Protestant, that person got the job because it, they started to talk about what was called the Protestant work ethic because what was reformed was not just practices of the church, but it was whatever you do, do unto the glory of God. And so there was this great understanding of the, uh, I am the priesthood of the believers. And so work, art, I mean, it just, it, it spread so far. So, but before we do that, let's do a little did you know, because this is fun, right? All right, these aren't true and false today, but let's just do a little did you know, just to get us going into the 16th century. Did you know that my clicker works? In the year 1500, the world population reaches 400 million people. To put that in perspective, we have 333 million in the United States today. And 7.79 billion people in the world today. Just gives you a kind of a perspective on how many people were residing in the world. 1503, Da Vinci begins the Mona Lisa. I'm sure you guys knew that though. And Michelangelo sculpts the David and finishes it a year later. Listen, as I was going through the facts of the 16th century, I had to like slow down so I didn't put, all, the 16th century was awesome. It truly was an awesome time in the world. I think I have a picture. I guess I don't. Maybe it'll come up later. Uh, the building of St. Peter's Basilica started in Rome. That's worth noting to keep in mind when it comes to indulgences, which we'll talk about. In 1510, uh, Peter Henlein invents the pocket watch. Interesting. Interesting. We haven't talked about science. Does anybody know anything scientific that occurred in the 16th century, early 16th century? Oh, he was, he was before. Gutenberg was in four, uh, 1430, 1450. What did Copernicus do? Do we know? Copernicus 
Ah, yes. Yes, he suggested that the earth moves around the sun. That was radical in that day. That got him in a lot of trouble in that day, that the earth actually went around the sun, and the sun didn't go around the earth. Yes, Virginia. That's right. It didn't even, you didn't even have to challenge the church on theological issues to get yourself in trouble. You challenged the church on some scientific issues, and it got you in trouble. Um, I think we've got a picture of the David. Um, I cropped it because that's what's appropriate to do here. But this is just the statue of the David that was, uh, that was done by um, Michelangelo. I find it interesting that Leonardo and Michelangelo are two of the Ninja Turtles as well. Um, some will get that, you know, pizza and sewers. Um, but there's a, just a picture of the artwork the, that was being done uh, in that time period. Let's move on. A couple more did you knows of this period. Um, what about navigation? What about exploration? Anything? Now we know 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue, but then what happens? What's that? Magellan, ha, ah, yes, absolutely. He set sail from Spain to sail around the world. Sadly, when he reaches the modern day Philippines, um, roughly 18, to two, 18 months to two years later from his time of setting sail, he is killed. Um, here's an interesting one. 1521, the first running of the bulls occurs. You ever see that? I don't know if you see like a, like a YouTube clip or watch something online and you, you see these people running away from bulls. Uh, so that started in 1521. Does anybody know anything about that? Oh, of course you do, Virginia. It's a big deal. <laughs> we probably do things that uh, the people in Spain think are crazy too. Uh, but running from bulls is crazy. I would rather be a spectator than a participant. How many of you would ever like to do that? Any thoughts? No? Where's the sense of danger? YOLO, right? Let's go. <laughs> I think it's common sense. But there, 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 it'd be interesting to look more into the history of that. Yes, Virginia. I think he was a little bit later. Yes. Oh, that's a good, that's an interesting fact. Yeah, I did not know that. Ah. What about music? What was going on in music? Ben, you know music. What was going on in music during this time? Anything good? I couldn't find much, but in 1529, Away in a Manger is published. Probably. And so, um, we sing it today. A bit different and translated, but we sing it today. All right, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the Christian world. And not, I'm not going into the Reformation yet, but things that were happening. In 1516, the Geneva Bible was printed. It is the first Bible that actually had verse numbers on it. There were chapters before, but this one had the verse numbers right next to it. Uh, you have Bibles today. I, I'm certain that every one of your Bibles have verse numbers next to it. They do make, the ESV makes a Bible called the Reader that has no, chap, no verses, which is an interesting to, to look at and to read. We used to joke with, uh, or play a joke with, um, when students would come into class uh, over there without Bibles, I'd give them the Reader, you know, and say, okay, now open your Bible to, you know, read Matthew twenty two eighteen. 18. Go there, couldn't find any verses, you know, and um, 
But originally, we, we, I think we understand and know that the Bible, Paul didn't put verses and chapters. That was added way later, a thousand years later. And it was done so that we could navigate our Bibles better. But chapters and verses are not inspired. And so sometimes translators have not necessarily gotten the divisions right. There are times where um, it might be better that certain portions um, fall into the chapter before. And so we just need to be mindful when we're reading and understanding that chapters and verses, even paragraph breaks, are all added to help us. Um, but they're not always completely accurate. Okay. Uh, 1568, bottled beer is invented in London. Again, you know, the Scots did whiskey like 100 years before that. Interesting to consider the history of London from this point forward. Um, 1578, William Bourne draws plans for a submarine. I thought Andrew would like this, you know, down at EB. Um, The first plans for a submarine. I was kind of shocked by that. All right, scientists, one more. 1590, the microscope is invented. Also, for our English major, Shakespeare uh, begins his career. Interesting things going on. And there's a picture of the Geneva Bible. Um, And you can see uh, these being the uh, verse divisions here. Um, I can't really make out what this says. I think that's John chapter something. Verse, chapter right there, verse number right here, but I could be mistaken. Um, That being said, there were three dates that I did not give you that I found very interesting that I wanted to separate for a different slide. And I think they all have something in common. In 1515, coffee from Arabia appears in Europe. This is important. Coffee. What comes with coffee? Caffeine! In 1516, Erasmus produces a Greek New Testament. In 1517, Martin Luther nails 95 theses to the door at Wittenberg. So let's let's turn this into a mathematical equation here. What do you get when you take coffee and a Greek New Testament. You get a Reformation. And so, I don't know if these things are all connected or not, but I, if, you never know. Uh, maybe the coffee helped Erasmus to stay up and do his translation work, um, and so, f- so forth. But coffee hits Europe, Greek New Testament hits Europe, Reformation hits Europe. Boom, boom, boom. So, let's talk about one of the most influential figures of this generation, Martin Luther. Give you some facts on him. Um, he is born in Eiselben, Eisel, Germany. Uh, 1505, receives his master's degree. 1507, ordained to the priesthood. 1512, earns his doctorate. He's an educated man. He's a well-educated man. He's the professor of scripture at the University of Wittenberg. And something that was very important about his life is as he is lecturing in the university, he does two lectures on two books from 1513 to 1516 that make a humongous, dramatic influence upon his life. He lectures on the Psalms and he lectures on Romans. And this, as he's, as he's working through the, the, the exegesis and the, and the careful reading of scripture and, 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 and seeking to interpret it correctly and rightly, his, it's as though the word of God is transforming his mind and his thinking is beginning to change. And, but he's not, he's not reforming at this point, he's, but he's, he's starting to think and he's starting to see practice and, 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 and scripture, and, and, and so there's this, there's this tension that is starting to grow in Martin Luther. It is a misnomer to think that the Reformation happened like this. It is also a misnomer to think that the Reformation was some unified effort as well. There's a Lutheran Reformation. There's the Reformed Reformation. There's the Anabaptist. There's the Radical Reformation. It all splinters out, but Luther is kind of like the, at least the big name, that, that sparked it, but in reality, there was a guy in Swiss territory named Ulrich Zwingli who 
was actually writing uh, and preaching Protestant Reformation theology and doctrine a year before Luther. Um, so Luther's just the bombastic, the, the, the loud one. The, 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 uh, so he draws the attention. Zwingli is a much more pious man. He's, he's a much more um, mellow person. Probably a bit more of a godly man. Um, so with that being said, the understanding that the groundswell, the great schism, the, where does authority lie, all this stuff, different pockets of Europe in different places, they were coming to these same conclusions at the same time and preaching the same doctrines without necessarily meeting one another at first. That is very important to stand, but, uh, understand. But one thing is clear. By 1516, by the finish of Romans, Luther is convinced of sola fide. Does anybody know what that means? What is that? Faith alone. What, is he, what do we mean by faith alone? Faith alone in what? For what? This is the question. All right, great. I'm glad you answered. Now take a Bible and open to Romans 1, 17. Yeah, something, you never know when you're going to get assigned something. These two scriptures begin to so influence Martin Luther, and you can turn to him as well, 117 in Galatians 3, 10, and 11. It is worth the pause to read them. You got it? Nice and loud, brother. Why don't you go back and read verse 16 and then into 17 so we know what it is. So this is what's, what's going on in Luther's mind. He reads, righteousness living, the righteous shall live by faith, or the just shall live by faith. The righteous, those who have been declared righteous. We'll talk a little bit between infused and imputed righteousness. But Luther is growing in his conviction that righteousness is not infused, as is the Catholic doctrine of the day, and even this modern day, but it is imputed that righteousness is given by faith. The complete and total righteousness of Christ is imputed imputed to him by faith, faith being trust, trusting in the finished work of Christ. And so this, 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 this imputed, this declared righteous upon the basis, the full merits of Christ and Christ alone. That is what Romans 1.17 is saying, and that is what Luther is becoming greatly convinced of. Furthermore, in Galatians 3.10, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. There's bondage. A works-based salvation will leave you cursed. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Paul, the logical person that he is, verse 11, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. Paul's not making this stuff up. Paul is actually quoting Habakkuk, where God is speaking to Habakkuk and tells him, the righteous shall live by faith, Habakkuk 2, 4, I believe. And so justification by faith is an Old Testament doctrine. It is not a Reformation doctrine. It is not a New Testament doctrine. It is as old as the prophets. It is as old as God's means of salvation. How were Adam and Eve saved? They were justified by faith. They believed in the faith of the promise. There has never been a generation that has not had the gospel. They were told in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. That was the promise of the gospel. It was the proto-evangel. They didn't understand times, places. You know, Peter would say that the prophets longed to look in. Even the angels longed to look into these things. Discerning when and the times that they would come, but they didn't know. But they looked forward in faith, and Abraham believed God, and he was 
justified by faith. He was declared righteous. It was credited to him as righteousness. This begins to settle in the mind of Luther. And this sets a conscience free, but not just free. Luther was set on fire by this. This freedom in Christ, this yoke that has been upon his back has been let go. And so Luther is ecstatic that he, has, that, that he has come to see and understand sola fide, that my basis, my standing before God is not based upon my merits or my cooperation, but because the Son of God loved me and gave himself up for me. Because the Son of God, by his passive and active obedience, fulfilled the whole of God's law, and it is credited to my account. Galatians, or 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake God made him, Christ, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Conversion sets a person on fire. Especially when you have this, this, this already a very robust theology. Think about the Apostle Paul. He had a very robust theology. He understood theology proper. He understood, uh, you know, you didn't have to convince him about literal, you know, six-day creation. He, he had those things down. But when he understood that it was Christ the Lord, the Messiah, it set him on a path on fire. And so Luther is convinced of sola fide, and it is like a fire in the bones. It cannot be stopped. And so a couple other things here that we'll consider just kind of snapshot of Luther's life. Uh, he had this battle with a man named John Tetzel. Ever heard of that name before? It's a very important name for the Reformation. John Tetzel, indulgences, and the 95 Theses all come together. Um, now, in the Council of Trent in uh, 46, 15. 46, I believe, around that time, they, they condemn the, the sale of uh, indulgences. They say it's not a practice. Uh, if you were to talk to anybody uh, who knows something about Roman Catholicism, they would say, we've never indulse, endorsed the sale of indulgences. Well, you just need to read history. They were indo endorsed by two different popes. Yes. So, yeah, the, the building of St. Peter's Basilica was done through the sale of indulgences. And we'll talk about the treasury of merit, which um, was part of the construct of, of indulgence, indulgences. Uh, Tetzel had this little jingle that he would make up. I believe it was, uh, a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And he was encouraging the people, if you put your money in the coffer, you are paying the way for your loved ones to get out of purgatory. Now, part of Luther's Reformation isn't so much that he, was, that he thought all of these practices were abominable, but he saw the exploitation of the German people. There was a sense of nationalism in here in Luther's mind as well. Luther, a German, saw his people being taken advantage of. They were listening to Tetzel. They were given their money, and Luther's going through the Bible. He's like, this is nowhere. This is nowhere. So part of his reformation, the 95 Theses, which were the reform of indulgences, was saying, put a stop to this. Put a stop to the burdens on my people. I'm going to protect my people from this practice. And so by the 95 Theses, 1517, on All Hallows' Eve, uh, Luther walks up to the door of the castle of Wittenberg, nails the 95 Theses. Now, you, we understand that he wasn't going up there to start a reformation, right? He was going up there. He, the, these, the 95 theses were written in Latin. He puts them on the door. So who can read Latin? Just the educated at the time. And they were meant to be, that was the practice. You would put whatever, you would post whatever you, you wanted to discuss with the faculty of the school. You'd put it up there. And then there would be a time where we'd come together and have these theological discussions about practices and things like that. Well, I forget the guy's name, but somebody got a hold of his 95 theses. 
translated them into German, and printed them. You find out who that guy's name was. He's the guy who started the Reformation because he put it into the, into the hands of, of the people. Luther wanted to have a conversation with his colleagues about reform. If Luther wanted it to get to everybody, he would have wrote it in German. He would have wrote the 95 Theses in German. That being said, by 1520, three years later, it has come to a helm, and Luther is ready to split with Rome. This was unheard of. Hus called for a reformation, not a split. Wycliffe called for certain reforms and fixed these issues. None of them thought about splitting. Luther had gotten to the point where it was, the line is drawn, and we, I have to die here. I'm going to die on this hill, and I can't go back. He crossed, what is it, crossing the Rubicon? He crossed, and he was not turning back. In 1521, he is executed, and, or, or excommunicated, I'm sorry. No, he did not. They tried to ex- execute him, but I believe it was Frederick the Wise saves him from the Diet of Worms, puts him up in a castle, and in the time that he sits in the castle after the Diet, we'll talk about that in a second, but he puts him up in the castle, and so Luther is in isolation, kind of secret exile, and so he devotes his time to do what? Do we know what Luther does? He writes, because remember, movements last because people write, but not only does he write, He takes the Latin, he takes the Greek, he takes the Hebrew, he puts it all together, and he writes the German Bible. You want to know how a movement can last even longer? Translate a Bible into your own language. And so, the diet of worms, you read that, it is not what he ate. Um, That would be a nasty diet, but it was the gathering, right? It was the time that Luther was summoned before the great council. We're often familiar with this This time he comes before them, the emperor is there, the pope is there, all of the who's who is at this council, and Luther is, if you've watched any of the movies, I don't know how accurate the depictions are, but Luther's standing there, and the question is, will you recant? And Luther says, I got to think about it. Can I have a night? So he goes back that night. And he's wrestling. You know, they've got all of his writings out there against, against the papacy, all these things. And so that night, he's, he's wrestling in his room. He's, he's got just a, a very difficult time. I mean, lit, literally, the weight of the world is on this man's shoulders that night. He comes back out the next day. And they ask him, Luther, will you recant? And the greatest, one of the greatest lines of church history is ever spoken. And he says something along the lines, unless convinced by scripture, for we know that popes and councils have erred. Unless my mind is convinced by scripture, my mind is held captive by the word of God, I cannot and will not recant. So help me God. 1521, it is clear there are now two churches. There is a Protestant church. Lutheranism is birthed. Luther would never have liked the name, but that being said, he stands as a giant of the faith. None of us would attend Luther's church. We don't agree with um, much of his, or some of his certain doctrines, but when it comes to sola fide, sola scriptura, sola Christus, sola gratia, Sola Deo Gloria, the five solas of the Reformation, we lock arms with him and the many who came uh, along with him. So a couple more things uh, just about Luther's life. Remember I told you the Reformation had more to do than just a Protestant church? Luther helped contribute to the Reformation of marriage. He, was, he married... Uh, Katarina von Bora, after rescuing her and eight other nuns from a nunnery. Um, so in Germany, there were, nine, there were these nine nuns. He, he helps them to get safe passage out of the nunnery because Luther said, listen, he totally believed that uh, the priests do not need to be celibate. And people started getting on this movement, and they were like, you mean I can marry? 
whoa, like, I'm not sure that's why they became Lutherans, but uh, there was a sense, and so he helps the nuns to, to marry. Well, this one, Katie, she was very, very, uh, how would you say it? I wouldn't say obstinate, um, but a determined woman. And she, uh, much to Luther's, uh, younger than Luther, was determined that she was going to marry Martin. And Martin was like, nope, that's not, I will help you, but I have no interest in a wife. Um, and so he kept trying to get her married. But he, it just kept falling through. There was no suitor. Uh, I think it was in one text I was reading, finally she prevailed upon him. And he marries Katie. Um, and it was an awesome story of, especially in the 16th century, of love and their, their marriage. A new, a new par- a paradigm for Protestant marriage. One quote, Luther and Katie enjoyed a feisty vibrant and deeply affectionate 21 year marriage relationship that produced six children. Luther had no issues with public displays of affection. Now this is the 16th century. Some people today have issues with public displays of affection. Luther was was very fine with it. <laughs> Another thing that I had even read Katie Katie built him a brewery, Um, and yes, there is a dark side to Luther. You would find Luther often later in the days, um, even around the time of the Reformation onward, he would be in the bars. He was a a drinker. He was a, uh, he, you know, um, he got that chin from drinking too many beers, I think. And so... (laughs) Um, But there's also, before we totally just kind of elevate and deify a man that we should not, because from Esther to Moses to John the Baptist to everybody but Jesus that God has raised up for movements are are failed, flawed individuals. And so Luther himself is a failed, flawed individual. He is a great sinner of a great Savior. And so a couple things about his life that is worth noting um, to treat him as fairly as we possibly can. Oh, is, it's for the church, guys. That's, that's what we do. Um, can I get some help over here? Am I going to be able to get back? It just killed. So Luther, there is a dark side of Martin Luther. Um, and, it, and what tends to happen in his life is that as he gets um, older in life, these, this, these bad sides of Martin become more and more visible. Um, and let's see. Yes, the dark side of Luther. Um, he compromises. After the Protestant Reformation, it's well underway. We're getting into 10 years after the Diet of Worms. Um, there's a situation where Prince Philip, who was m- more the political power in Germany at the time, um, wants to have a bigamous marriage. Uh, bigamy is having two wives knowingly, and they all know everybody, or they don't, the wives necessarily don't know, but it is two legitimate marriages, so to speak. Um, and so Prince Philip, at the time, did not love his current wife, met a younger girl that he fell madly in love with, wanted to marry her, but he was already married. And so he wanted to have another wife. His wife, his first wife, approved of it. And so, but he knew this was a very, this was a, a no-no, basically, in the church. So he goes to Luther and explains the situation. And he tries to appeal to some Old Testament texts. Philip does. And so Luther caves and approves of this allows for this to happen, Uh, both one to sort of soften the conscience of Philip, but it was also a move of political expediency. Um, To not approve of this would have helped would have fractured Germany. And so Luther, being a pragmatic in this situation, compromises the truth of God's word, the ethics of the Bible, for the sake of political expediency. You cannot talk about Martin Luther without talking about anti-Semitism. Uh, To not see this stain on his life is to not treat him and understand him rightly. In 1534, he writes, 
one of his uh, most famous and darkest books, The Jews and Their Lies. And so Luther, early on in his life, is very, I don't want to say say very pro-Jewish, but you don't see any anti-Semitism in Martin Luther's life early on. Uh, Jesus was a Jew, is a Jew, and um, you would even see that Martin Luther desired to evangelize the Jews. But as time went on, he had this growing anti-Semitism against the Jews. Um, Nobody actually knows 100% why. There are many theories. Um, some would say their continual rejection uh, of, of the Messiah uh, caused Luther to, to, to be angered, but we don't necessarily know for certainty why. What we do know is that Luther was uh, an early pioneer of anti-Semitism in Germany. You can fast forward 500 years and see where Luther's legacy led Germany in certain times. Adolf Hitler read Luther. Um, Luther's temper. Luther, as he got older, he became more uh, cantankerous. I don't know if that's the word. Um, But his temper. His temper began um, to really rule. And so he uh, isolated people. He, if you weren't Lutheran, you were wrong and you were less than. There was, a, there was an issue over uh, communion where there was something called the Marburg Colloquy. And this is when Luther and Zwingli, um, and, and we've kind of, like if our tr- we trace back our family tree, we kind of come more from Zwingli uh, in our family tree of, of um, re- reformers. They come together to, to discuss the issue of consubstantiation. Or, or again, the Lord's Supper has so much to do with the Reformation. Luther believes in this thing called consubstantiation. He takes like one step outside the Catholic Church, but kind of keeps a foot in there with the literal, the whole literal transubstantiation, um, which again, that was a fire for the Reformation. Zwingli rightly understands the Lord's table to be symbolic. It, it, is, it is do this in remembrance of me. We, we even put Jesus' words on the table so that we are reminded when we take of the Lord's Supper, it is memorial. We do this in remembrance of Christ, what he has done. We look at our own lives, where we stand, and we look forward to the day. So it is past, present, future. And so they come together, and they agree on 14 and a half issues. And and, and so Philip, at the time, calls this meeting together because he's trying to keep Protestantism united. This is very important because the Holy Roman Empire will come against them. And there was getting ready to be a war. There was getting ready to be a battle between the Protestants and the Catholics. Had there not been an Eastern Muslim invasion or the, the Arabs coming from the East, um, which stopped the war that was a, right on the, uh, on, the, on the helm of happening. Anyways, they come together. Zwingli agrees with him on 14 and a half things. Luther throws the whole meeting away because of this half a thing that they can't get over. And Zwingli's like, you're my brother. You know, we can agree. And Luther, in his fiery temper, um, attacks him, attacks the Jews. And Luther dies February 18th, 1546, after multiple heart attacks. I will not say, when we look at the life of Martin Luther, he had his ups, he had his downs. I'm not ready to throw him out at all, I think he was raised up for such a time as this that he, that he lived in. And we have to understand that we are all people with flaws. That we have our own areas. This is not to justify anything that Luther stood, uh, that, that was negative about the life of Luther. Um, but we should recognize and understand people fairly. And we should treat him fairly. God used him in a mighty way despite his failures. And if there's a word of encouragement and exhortation to you all, is that God uses flawed vessels. I'm one, you're one. And it's despite our flaws and our difficulties and our shortcomings, God uses them, why? So that he gets all the glory, you know, out of the people that he uses. So uh, this, is, this is Martin Luther. This is the life of Luther. And we're going to end here uh, today um, 
but I want to get into more of, again, that was an overview of Luther. Luther's Reformation. What was it about him? What was the question? And I'll give you the, the cliffhanger. Here's the question. How was a sinner made right with God? And so we'll consider this next week, and we get into the indulgences, and we'll get into the Lateran Council once again, and we'll also consider the treasury of merit and how much that doctrine made such an impact. And then we'll, we'll start to branch out to how this Reformation affected different parts of Europe. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your history, that we can learn from it, that we can grow from it. And Father, uh, we recognize our sin is ever before you. And against you and you alone have we sinned, Lord. And we uh, do come to you repentant. And as we think about even the sins of those that have come behind us, Lord, and we recognize that despite their failures, Lord, you did use them. And I pray that we would be holy and fit vessels, that we would be uh, equipped and uh, ready for honorable use in the master's hand. Father, help us, we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.